Listen, um, clearly one of us got the, the, the memo wrong about the dress codes, yeah? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But I thought today that I would bring a piece of Scotland with, with, with me. I've been in the US since the 9th of um, October and I'm missing home, but I wear my kilt just to remind me of home. Um, but I, I'm here today to talk about violence. And this, this thing here is, is often associated with violence. It's the only time in Scotland I get to wear a knife, right? Other than the kilt, I can't carry a knife in Scotland. But um, this, this is, I think, in history has been known as a, a gang tag. You know, and if you, if, if, you look at, if you look at history, you know, you could count on the Scots to save the world. We, we, we have this badge where if you want something done, come, you know, come to the Scots. You know, even, even Hollywood, you know, do, do you recognize this guy? He defined the Scottish. No, he didn't. Not at all. That's, that's a badge which we really wanted to lose over the last few years, this notion of, of violence. You know, even, even our cows look tough in Scotland, you know. I've got these cows living behind me when I, I live in Scotland. But um, I think we've tried to soften our approach over the, over the last few years. So, so for the next few minutes, I'm here to, to today, you know, probably wondering why I'm here to talk about violence. It's, a, it's an issue that is very personal to me. I was, a, I was a police officer for 30 years, and I retired from policing in May this year. And you're thinking, how can a guy so young retire, yeah? That's what you're thinking. But I, got, I retired, I spent 30 years as a police officer. That's, that's me there. I was 19 years old. My, my, my mother taught me to iron shirts the week before that picture was taken. So I'm an expert ironer. But um, one thing I really learned about policing is that whilst we need law enforcement, we're never going to police our way out of the situation. You know, prevention of violence starts here. It starts in schools, universities, colleges, workplaces, events like this where people are feeling inspired to make a change in the world. And I firmly believe that individuals can make such a massive, massive difference. In moments of crisis, look for the helpers. And I think when it comes to violence and abuse, sometimes we need to get people to take a stand. There's lots of reasons why people don't take a stand, and I understand that. But I want you to start thinking about why this is an important issue for you. Violence has the potential to be deeply personal to everybody in this room. It may have been personal to people in this room. This is young Sam, and um, I spoke to Sam's mom a few weeks ago about this, what I was doing in uh, this event. Sam was a 23-year-old man that I knew I got, I got to know through my work in the police. Um, he helped set up a domestic violence helpline in Scotland. And Sam became a statistic a few years ago. He was stabbed to death in Scotland. He was a, he was a dad, he was 23 years old. He was a dad like me. He had, he had the, whole, the whole world, the, the whole life, his whole life ahead of him. And he was taken away from us as a result of violence. So violence has been personal to me. These are my girls. My daughter's watching this just now. My daughter hates this picture. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> but that's not my house. I don't live in a castle. But um, I have updated. I have updated. But I'm going to go back to that picture. Jennifer, it's back again. Picture's there. Anyway, these are my girls. So I think when you know, everybody in this room, if, any, if you take anything from this, this talk, think about it personally. My daughters have been victims of harassment violence in the past, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by violence um, shortly, but start thinking about this as, a, as something that could impact on you. Let's not wait for it to come knocking at the door and become really impactful on you. Let's start to really start thinking differently about violence. You know, step one for me is widen your lens around violence. Stop looking at violence as, as the, the physical stuff, because if we keep looking at violence as the end result, we have victims, we have perpetrators. And these victims and perpetrators could be people that we care about. So let's not wait for it, to, for it to happen. Let's start to think about violence as a behavior, as an attitude. Because if we sweat the small stuff down here, okay, underneath the, the tip of that pyramid, we can start to potentially make a difference with the real physical stuff. And I'm not saying that physical stuff is more serious than the some of the emotional stuff, because I know that that, that can be dependent upon the, on the person suffering it. But I really believe that if we can, if we can focus on the name calling, if we can focus on the rumors, the gossiping, the, the sexualization that's going on in society, we can make a big difference at this end of the continuum. So we'll, let's start thinking about it. And this notion of silence. Silence is the infection that keeps violence going. We all have a responsibility to take a stand. You know, over the 30 years in the police, the police service, I interviewed countless people 
who, who were witnesses to violent crime, witnesses to murder, witnesses to, to sexual assault, witnesses to stabbings, assaults taking place in the street. And how many of them do you think would say something like, I knew something was going to happen? A lot of them did. And I often thought to myself, imagine what we could achieve if we could get people, you know, because most bystanders will intervene when, when something becomes physical. But imagine a world where people in this, in this room here, in, in, our, in, in our communities, um, spotted the red flags at the, at the left-hand side of this continuum, started to look at the name calling, and started to really think of that as a harm. Imagine what a world that if we get, could get people to support people at this end of the continuum, even challenge people. And I would challenge you to start thinking about what you could be doing to challenge friends, work colleagues, who may be exhibiting some of these forms of abuse. Because we could make a massive difference. We could really have a great impact on levels of violence in Scotland, sorry, in Scotland, in the United States and across the world. Step two, hands up if you are here today with someone that you know. Raise your hands. So, most people. Hands up if you have met somebody that you didn't know before today. Fantastic, so it's about networking. Hands up if you really know, really know what that person thinks about a certain subject. All right, okay. Imagine a world if you did know that your person shares thoughts about domestic violence, sexual assault, violence. Imagine if you really knew what that person thought. It'd be kind of cool that, because it would reassure you that you actually think the same as your friends, your peers. So my, my chat today is, for, I want you to start talking to your friends about what you think about these, these subjects. I'm a, I'm a glass half full type of guy. I firmly believe that the vast majority of people in this world are healthy individuals. But there's what exists, this false, cons this false consensus, where the majority of us often feel like we're in the minority, and the minority of us feel like we're being represented by the majority. That's so true in this world. You know, most people don't need to know the truth. They just need reassurance that what they believe is the truth. So step two for me is about providing reassurance. And that's not just about me speaking to you. That's about you speaking to your friends, your colleagues, your work colleagues, your, your relatives about this stuff. Tell people. No, don't tell people. Shout about it. Again, don't wait for violence to become personal. It's so important that we, that we think about that. Step three is just keep doing what we're doing. Prevention for me is like a dripping tap. If you work in schools and universities, drip this type of work into your workplace, into your schools. The more you fill the, the glass up, it becomes more full. It, it, it fills right to the very, very top. That's, that's awareness. People feel more empowered. They feel, that, they feel that you take this subject very, very seriously. Again, never assume people around you know how you feel on a certain subject. Talk about it. So, some steps you need to think about. Widen your lens when it comes to violence. Don't just look at violence as the physical stuff. Sweat the small stuff. That saying, don't sweat the small stuff, when it comes to violence, pants. Right? You need to really sweat the small stuff at this end. Start talking about it. Reassurance. We all need reassurance. We won't step up if we don't have reassurance that people around us know what you or they think. And you be part of that solution. You start thinking about what I can do, what can I say in my daily lives that can make a difference in this world. Have a why. Think about violence as something that could be deeply personal to you. Because if it hasn't already been, the potential is very, very real. Um, so for me, how we start to think about this full glass, how we work to this full glass approach, you know, prepare yourself. Raise your awareness on this stuff. Do the knowledge. Okay? Learn about it. Read the papers. Read books. Do the knowledge. Share your knowledge. That sharing of knowledge provides the reassurance that we all need, but other people need on this subject. And prepare yourself. I'm going to do a workshop later on which will start to talk about what we could be doing. How can we widen the lens of the bystander. Because most bystanders will really think there's only one thing that I can do. No, no, there's lots of things that you can be doing. So consider your options. Prepare yourself. I'm going I'm I'm to be, be pressing the pause button in that room back there and allow us to assess the situation and deal with it. We're all guideposts in this world. We have mums, we have dads, we have friends, we have work colleagues. We're all guideposts in this world. You know, be kind, be brave, be bold. Someone's mentioned be bold, be awesome. We need, we're needing a lot of that in this world just now. We need people to be awesome, to be kind, to be brave, and be bold. I wanted to really leave you with how I talk about heroism. Heroes don't work as well in Scotland. The term hero doesn't work in Scotland, but I'm trying to change that a little bit. My, my, how I look at heroism in Scotland is back to Martin Luther King's statement. 
He would sit at my round table. Definitely sit at my round table. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Not only are you helping other people, you're helping yourself. That sense of giving something to somebody else with no expectation that you're going to get something back. It's a very powerful tool for us to, all, to, all, to, all to think about and consider. And the title of my presentation, One Person Can Do So Much. It takes one person to create followers, to create other people to step up and follow. Be that one person. If it's today, fantastic. If it's tomorrow, great. But at any time in your life, step up and challenge. And ask yourself the question, if I was having a bad day and the weight of the world was on my shoulders and someone came up to me and said, are you okay? How would that make you feel? Because that's what's going to make another person feel. You can make the difference to support people and challenge people as well in this situation. So I applaud you for coming along to this event and thank you for looking at my eyes and not my knees. Okay, so thanks very much and um, look forward to speaking more with you today. Thank you. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.